Hey everyone, I am Nikki Blackman with SMNP Reviews. Welcome to today's video on the diagnosis and management of anxiety disorders in adults within the primary care setting. There are several anxiety disorders that you will encounter on your board exam and as a nurse practitioner, such as panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, even specific phobias. Anxiety disorders are a very common concern seen in primary care, so today we will specifically focus on generalized anxiety disorders, including some differential diagnoses to consider. Let's go ahead and get started. First off, I always like to point out that anxiety is a normal emotion when it's experienced temporarily and in proportion to acute stressors. What we will be discussing today is anxiety disorders, which is when symptoms of worry are more chronic and interfere with daily life. Can you remember what some of those common symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder are? So I really like to use the mnemonic WATCHERS to remember those classic symptoms. WATCHERS stands for worry, anxiety, tension, concentration, hyperarousal, energy loss, restlessness, and sleep disturbance. To make that formal diagnosis, we are going to refer to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, or that DSM-5, which states symptoms must be present more days than not for at least six months. And who should we be screening for anxiety? The United States Preventative Services Task Force, or the USPSTF, recommends screening all adults ages 18 to 64 for anxiety disorders. There is no specific recommendation for how often you should screen for anxiety disorders, but a good rule is to screen adults who have never been screened before or more often depending on risk factors. Do you all know the name of a common anxiety screening tool? A common initial screening tool is the Generalized Anxiety Disorder 2 Item Scale, or the GAD-2. The questionnaire asks the patient to score how often in the last two weeks did they feel nervous, anxious, or on edge, or not be able to control their worry. Each of the two questions are given a numerical score, and then those scores are added up and totaled. Do you know what total score would indicate further follow-up? That's right, a score of three or more warrants further assessment. Now, if the GAD2 is positive, we would ask the patient to complete the GAD7, which includes five additional questions. This includes asking the patient if they feel they are worrying too much about different things, if they're having trouble relaxing, if they're being restless or irritable, and if they're feeling like something awful is about to happen. Now, how is this scored? So it's scored exactly the same way as the GAD2. Each question is given that numerical score and then totaled together. This total does include the two questions from the GAD2. The total score cutoff for mild anxiety is greater than five, for moderate anxiety, a score greater than 10, and 15 or more for severe anxiety. Like in all evaluations, you want to make sure to take a really good history. I cannot stress enough how important it is, how important it is to have really good history taking skills for practice and for taking your boards. We can use old carts, but a few history taking clues I want to highlight for anxiety disorders are asking about recent psychosocial triggers, maybe something like a new job, family or relationship stressors, intrusive thoughts, depressive symptoms, symptoms of panic, and of course, medical history. You're also going to ask about family history and substance abuse. You can use those answers to help narrow down your differential diagnosis list. Okay, so let's say our GAD2 and GAD7 indicated generalized anxiety. Although these scales were designated for generalized anxiety disorder, they also can detect other forms of anxiety. Let's take a look at what some of those differentials might be. Do you have any ideas? Well, we are certainly going to be thinking about panic disorder if our patient tells us about times of intense worry with a super fast onset. 
What are some symptoms of a panic attack? So symptoms of a panic attack can include tachycardia, feeling of choking, chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, and even fear of dying. A panic attack can coincide with many other conditions, but panic disorder is characterized by recurrent panic attacks and fear of future panic attacks with that avoidant behavior. Speaking of avoidant behavior, what if during your history taking you find out that your patient's worry is primarily concerning contaminated surfaces and it compels them to wash their hands or body compulsively? When a particular worry is associated with a compulsion, we want to be considering obsessive compulsive disorder on our differential list. Or what about a fear only related to certain scenarios? Maybe something like flying. Then we might want to be considering situational anxiety or a specific phobia. And what about some of the potential medical causes of increased anxiety? Hyperthyroidism could certainly present with similar symptoms of anxiety. If you did suspect a patient had hyperthyroidism, you would want to assess for other symptoms like unexplained weight loss, diarrhea, fatigue, excessive sweating, things of that nature. Finally, we always, always, always want to be screening for depression as it is super common for patients to be experiencing anxiety and depression in tandem. A bonus question here. If the patient is experiencing depressive symptoms, what very important assessment should we not miss? That's right, we always want to assess for symptoms of suicidality. Remember, as new nurse practitioners, if you are unsure of the diagnosis, do not be afraid to consider referring out to psychiatry for further evaluation and treatment or asking a more experienced clinician for help. Once the diagnosis of generalized anxiety is made, you'll want to start discussing those treatment options. Do you know what this might entail? We always want to be practicing shared decision making because the best treatment options are going to be the ones that patients are comfortable with. Generally speaking, treatment should include psychotherapy and or medications. Cognitive behavioral therapy is recognized as the preferred psychotherapy for patients experiencing generalized anxiety disorder or GAD. However, when anxiety symptoms are more severe, it can be hard to participate in therapy, so medications might need to be the first option. Do you all know what medications we could consider first line for GAD? That's right, our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors known as SSRIs and our selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or SNRIs are our first line medications. There are several SSRIs available within this class, including escitalopram, Lexapro, Fluoxetine or Prozac, Paroxetine or Paxil, Sertraline or Zoloft, just to name a few. Knowing a few key details about each medication will help us know which one to trial first. For example, fluoxetine is fairly activating with a lot of jittery side effects, so be sure to keep that in mind. Paroxetine is a more sedating medication, so individuals are, who are experiencing issues with sleep might have some improvement while taking this at night. And just be careful of those anticholinergic side effects with paroxetine, especially in older adults. However, paroxetine, sertraline, citalopram, and escitalopram have all been found to be effective in reducing anxiety. As clinicians, we want to tailor the treatment plan to be the best plan for our particular patient. A good thing to remember about our SNRIs, like duloxetine or Cymbalta, and venlafaxine or Effexor, is that they can also be used for things like chronic pain in management or migraine prophylaxis. If the SSRI or SNRI is working well for the patient, how long would we ideally like them to continue taking the medication? 
That's right, at least one year if the medication is working well for them. We can always evaluate our treatment plan and change our course of action if needed. We also have some second line medications that we can use for the treatment of anxiety. Buspirone is a medication that can be dosed multiple times per day. Similar to an SSRI or SNRI, Buspirone can take several weeks to reach its full effect. However, some patients can feel some relief of symptoms more quickly, even as soon as the first dose. It is also sometimes used as an adjunct medication on top of an SSRI if the SSRI alone is not enough to resolve anxious symptoms. You will also more than likely see beta blockers being used off-label for occasional anxiety. Beta blockers are really only useful for performance-based anxiety, specifically if the patient experiences physiological symptoms of anxiety, like tachycardia or tremors. Low-dose propranolol or hemangiol can be used 30 minutes before the anxiety-provoking event. SSRIs can have a pretty long lag time to get to that resolution of symptoms, sometimes even several months. If someone's anxiety symptoms are very severe or if they are having panic attacks, we might want to consider offering a temporary relief while waiting for a longer term medication to start working. Do you know what class of medication we might use here? That's right, our benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are a class of very effective anxiolytic medications. However, they also can carry some pretty serious side effects and are considered a controlled substance. Some of the common benzodiazepines include alprazolam or Xanax, clonazepam or clonopin, diazepam, which is Valium, and lorazepam, or Ativan. These medications are fast-acting, but have varying half-lives. Do you remember which of these is the shortest-acting? That would be Alprazolam, or Xanax. And what about one of the longer-acting benzodiazepines? That would be Clonazepam, or Clonopin, which has a half-life of 40 hours. Who would you be especially concerned about when prescribing these medications to? That would be individuals with a history of substance abuse disorder, chronic pulmonary issues like COPD or sleep apnea, older adults, and anyone at an increased risk of falls. In general, benzodiazepines should not be prescribed for long periods of time, and they do carry a boxed warning of abuse and misuse, dependence and withdrawal, even respiratory depression when used with opioids. So when prescribing this class of medication, we would want to make sure that we are providing really comprehensive patient education regarding the risks and only prescribing the lowest effective dose for the shortest possible duration. And what are some of those side effects of benzodiazepines that we need to be on the lookout for? So these include drowsiness, confusion, decreased alertness, psychomotor impairment, and they have even been associated with increased risk of motor vehicle collisions. So we would definitely want to warn our patients against driving while using this type of medication and not to mix it with things like alcohol. All right, everyone, let's try out a practice question and see what we have learned. So which of the following patients, would it be appropriate for the nurse practitioner to prescribe clonazepam or clonopin to? Would it be a 26-year-old patient with a fear of flying and a history of substance abuse disorder, B, a 36-year-old patient newly diagnosed with severe GAD and panic attacks, a 59-year-old patient with insomnia and a history of COPD, or D, a 75-year-old patient with mild anxiety and a history of falls. And our correct answer is B, a 36-year-old patient with newly diagnosed generalized anxiety disorder. Benzodiazepines should be reserved for acute cases of panic or severe anxiety while waiting for a medication like an SSRI to take effect it would be appropriate to prescribe clonazepam or clonopin to a patient for a short duration. 
Answer C would not be correct because respiratory conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease puts patients at an increased risk of respiratory depression when they're using benzodiazepines. We would also want to be very cautious of prescribing a benzodiazepine to an older adult, especially someone with a history of falls. So answer choice D is also incorrect. And finally, answer A is not correct because of the risk of the patient's history of substance use disorder and misuse, which are associated with benzodiazepines. All right, that wraps up anxiety in primary care. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that that made diagnosing and managing generalized anxiety disorder a little less intimidating for your board exam and also for your future practice as a nurse practitioner. Remember, as a new nurse practitioner, you can always reach out for help. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and catch up on all of our latest videos. Until next time, take care everyone.